to introduce Monica McCullough, doctoral student working in my lab, defending her dissertation today. So, um, and Monica has done a great job. She started working in my lab as an undergrad, um, was wonderful as an undergrad, as an undergrad came to me on her project and said, you know, we've been looking at muscle, we've been doing this kind of stuff, I'd really like to start looking at the spinal cord, it's what, what's going on with nerve cell bodies and, and sort of heading up towards the, the CNS and the brain. And, and I'm thinking, there we go. <laughs> Great idea from an undergraduate student, outstanding. And so that really has formed the basis of her doctoral dissertation research, it, 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 looking at how does the exercise that we're doing affect the nervous system as we sort of move up more centrally. And, and so I was excited. And as an undergrad, she presented at national conferences, experimental biology, got best poster for an undergrad at Michigan Center of Neuroscience. Um, I think in some total it's been like 10 conferences you have presented at. Yeah. Help, she's also been a great teacher and mentor in the lab, so other undergrads that come in and work, she has mentored them on the projects. She's got at least four other undergrads to write abstracts and present at conferences. Um, so she's been extraordinarily productive in the lab, has a paper published already, another one that we just submitted the revisions that, that we're hoping is going to go. She's co-author on an invited review, and then have at least two other papers in the works. Um, and productivity didn't just end with publications. She's got a young lad somewhere in the building, and another on the way, and so you talk productivity, <laughs> Monica, sets the standard. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over, though, and let her tell everybody about her dissertation research project. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. OK, so today um, I will be talking about how exercise alters this um, protein called glial cell line-derived neurotrophic factor, or GDNF from here on out, um, protein content in the spinal cord. And to start off, though, let me tell you a little bit about what neurotrophic factors are. They're proteins that are made throughout the body, and they're synthesized and um, specialized to protect neurons. So during development, as we continue to grow, and then upon death, they're responsible for motor or neuron survival. And um, so to start off, though, um, we are all aging, whether you want to or not. And there are some phenotypical characteristics that are associated with aging that are very visible, such as with um, decreased elasticity of the skin, um, decreased hair, and um, increase in um, uh, downfall of mandible. And so, um, so some changes with aging are very obvious, but some changes um, are also occurring with the neuromuscular system, and um, we don't really see this every day. Um, so let me point out, here we have an MRI, and this is of a quadricep muscle. This is from a 25-year-old male, and then this is from a 65-year-old male. Now, for both images, the white in the middle, this dot, represents the bone. The dark mass surrounding the bone is the muscle, and then the white surrounding the muscle is fat. And I want to point out that with um, aging, we have the quadricep is actually the same size. However, we get a loss of skeletal muscle mass, and this leads to a decrease in muscle strength. And we also get an increase in connective tissue and um, fat that is intertwined in between the muscles. Now, um, by the time we're 60, we can lose about 30% um, of our muscle mass, and then starting as early as 25 to 35, we can start getting decrease in muscle strength. And so that continues on as we age. And some other changes that occur um, are with the nervous system. And so here I have, this is a motor neuron from the spinal cord of a healthy young um, anim or, uh, individual. And then it's innervating down to its skeletal muscle. And then here we have a cartoon of an older individual and then with its um, skeletal muscle. Sorry, let me close that. Okay, and so what I want to point out is that with age, what you see is this decrease in size of cell body. And then you also see this atrophy of the dendrites that surround, and then also you see representative decreases in skeletal muscle. And so by the time we're 60, we can lose anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of our motor neurons and motor units, and then that continues to um, as we age. And so, luckily though, um, oh no. And so obviously, what this means is that we have a lot of problems that continue on for us as adults. <laughs> where a lot of elderly people, they tend to have an increased incidence of falls because of the last lack of muscle strength. 
And then they can sometimes have a decrease quality of life. So the ability to perform certain tasks, such as daily tasks, like mowing the lawn, um, snow plowing, or snow shoveling, um, those are all decreased too with aging. And then so what this all means is that there's an increase in healthcare costs. And so the more or the more sedentary people are, the more decrease in muscle strength and mass, and then so more hip replacements, more physical therapy, more even psychological or uh, yeah, psychological um, therapy too, because to adapt to these changes that are associated with aging. So luckily though, it's not a doom sentence that we have though, and there are some ways that we can increase our muscle strength and the nerve <laughs> system. And here, my Mr. Meat Cakes. It's not my husband, Matt, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here we have different types of exercises. You can increase muscle strength. And so with resistance types exercise, you can see increase in muscle volume, as well as some exercises can increase um, actually mu muscle number. Um, our, um, voluntary exercises and endurance exercises are also beneficial, but not as evident as with resistance type exercises. Now, some less appreciated um, changes with exercises occur with the motor nervous system and motor neurons. So for those of you that are unfamiliar yet with um, motor neuron morphology, let me show you that, okay, so with exercise, what happens is that here at number one, these are the dendrites, where these receive inputs from um, electrochemical uh, stimuli um, from other neurons and um, chemicals, and they can increase dendritic complexity with exercise. Here at the cell body, where it houses the nucleus, we can increase cell body size, increase in protein synthesis and gene expression. Um, changes can occur at the level of the axon helix, which is responsible for transmitting um, action potentials to other neurons and other target tissues. And so with exercise, you can get an increase in conduction of different types of ions, such as the sodium. And then um, with the axon, this long tube here, um, you can get an increase of protein transport from the motor neuron to skeletal muscle or from skeletal muscle to the motor neuron, which is, which is helpful for metabolism and um, for the motor neuron itself. And then finally, you can also get adaptations that occur at the level of the neuromuscular junction where you can get increase in neuromuscular junction size, increase of acetylcholine release, which is the primary neurotransmitter for motor neurons, and then also, studies have shown an increase in neurotrophic factor production. And so this is the area that we're interested in, is to look at how neurotrophic factors change with exercise. And then um, I'll start out talking about the level of skeletal muscle and then go into the spinal cord and the motor. Now, the, uh, the neurotrophic factor that we are interested in is GDNF again. And so one reason is because it is essential for us to survive. And um, it has been found to date to still be the most potent trophic factor for motor neurons, where and um, it, um, sorry, <laughs> where there is, or it can induce 100% survival of motor neurons when you have treatment with GDNF compared to any other neurotrophic factor um, that was added. Um, a GDNF, when you treat with it, can also rescue motor neurons from spinal cord injury, again, where it can have maintained its size and number as compared to controls that had no treatment with GDNF. And then um, finally, GDNF knockout mice that are heterozygous can lose anywhere from 22 to 25% of their motor neurons. And why it's essential is that homozygous knockout mice are not able to survive. And so without it, we would not be able to survive. And so it's very important for us to study how GNF can be regulated. And so independent researchers have found beneficial effects of exercise and treatment with GDNF that cause similar responses, where an increase in neuromuscular junction size can occur with both exercise and GDNF, as well as um, hypertrophy or increase in volume and size of motor neurons both following exercise and treatment with GDNF. Um, an increase in acetylcholine release, again, the primary neurotransmitter for motor neurons. And then also, um, studies have found that both exercise and treatment with GDNF can slow the progression of ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is also known as Bugaric's disease here in America. And um, both can extend lifespan of individuals with ALS. So we think, though, part of the goal in our research is that maybe part of the beneficial effects of exercise that we see are in part driven by changes in GDNF. And so that is the basis of our research. And 
so with that, that's led me to a couple hypotheses that I have conducted as an undergraduate and a graduate student. Um, the first one, we wanted to look at exercise to see if it, it could increase gene and F protein levels um, of adult animals. And again, we looked at skeletal muscle and the spinal cord, and I'll show you um, results from that. And then also, how does aging alter gene and F protein content um, and localization? And then, oops. then we looked at um, the ALS models, um, transgenic animals. And we looked to see if exercise could increase GDNF production, and as well as if, um, if we blocked GDNF with antibodies against GDNF, could that also um, block the beneficial effects of exercise in those diseased animals? And so I'm going to start out with the first two sets of hypotheses. And so what we did for these was that adult male frog belly rats were exercised for either two weeks or four weeks. And um, different, there was a difference in intensities of exercise. And then um, we looked, of course, at AVMAP sedentary controls that had no exposure to running wheels. Um, for the first set of studies, um, hyaline muscles were removed, where we did protein quantification of GDNF with an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay. So for the first set of results, we looked at two weeks of exercise, and we looked at a low-intensity protocol where um, animals were exercised for at 10 meters a minute, and that's considered to be a walk training, and for a half hour a day for two weeks continuously with um, two days of rest on the weekends. And what we have here is that um, we have GDF protein content on the y-axis, and then we had examined the soleus muscle, which is a slow type um, muscle that is the hind limb. And what we found was that even at 10 meters a minute of this walk training of two weeks had increased GDNF protein content as compared to the sedentary controls. So then the next step was that we wanted to increase duration of exercise to see does four weeks of exercise increase GDNF content in muscle. Well others in the lab had looked at, sorry, had looked at um, four weeks of exercise and then the, the difference was that these animals were on treadmills instead of running wheels. And they found that in the soleus, there's an increase in GDNF protein content following four weeks of exercise, as well as in the gastrocnemius, which is also a hind limb muscle, but is more of a past type fiber. And so now we have evidence that at the level of the skeletal muscle, here in my little cartoon, GDNF, which is these little green dots, has been increased following two weeks and four weeks of exercise. Now, GDNF is known to be shipped back to the spinal cord in a retrograde fashion. Um, and so we have found that with exercise, we can get an increase in production at the level of skeletal muscle. So this led me to wonder, do we see similar changes at the level of the spinal cord um, where they can elicit a similar response? And so this led me to my set of studies for the bulk of my dissertation, where we had, again, um, exercise adult animals, and we had looked at males, frog belly rats, that were 6 months, 12 months, 18, and 24 months, and how this translates to human years is that a 6-month-old rat is like an 18-year-old human, a 12-month-old rat is like a 30-year-old human, 18-month-old um, is like a 45-year-old human, and then a 24-month-old is like a 6-year-old human. And so those are based on hormonal levels um, of the animal. And then so we had exercise animals in their lower running wheels anywhere from two weeks to six months to see if there's an increase with duration of exercise. And then we also looked at different intensities of exercise. And then of course um, we had sedentary controls that did not have exposure to running wheels. Okay, so then at the conclusion of all the studies, we had removed the lumbar spinal cord where we chose the lumbar spinal cord because these motor neurons innervate to those hind limb muscles, so we thought we could collaborate with others in the lab to see if there was uh, an effect there. And so we did protein quantification of GDNF for um, the lumbar region of L1 to L3 with an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay, or NELISA, and then with the Western blot to look at how much GDNF and what size of GDNF were being expressed. And then we looked at immunohistochemistry um, and looked at the L4, L5 region which was um, lower, or which innervated more to the lower limbs, and we used um, formalin and fixed tissues to look at GDNF and different antibodies there. Okay, so then, so 
we started out looking at two weeks of exercise, and we started with our youngest animals. So we have done three sets of experiments with these two weeks of exercise. We had one group that had undergone voluntary exercise, where the animals had continuous access to the running wheels, and then they could run at their own free will and however speed and duration and intensity that they would like. And then at the conclusion of that study, what we had done was that we had time matched how long those animals ran for involuntary group, so involuntary running, and we chose to look at our low intensity exercise of 10 meters a minute based on the studies from previous results. And then finally, we had one group that had been exposed to swimming where we put, plopped them in barrels and they swam for the same duration as the running group. And what we found was that with exercise, even at two weeks, all groups had increased GDNF protein content compared to the sedentary controls. And um, what I want to point out though, is that with our involuntary group, which is our low intensity exercise, there was a 6.5 fold increase in GDNF. It was no, not significant from the other two, but interesting that there was such a high fold change. And then we found that with um, our Western lot, there was a similar trend. And I would like to point out that with the six month old animals, we found a kilodalton size of 30 kilodaltons, or a molecular weight of GNF to be at 30 kilodaltons, where with um, aging, I'll show you in the next couple slides, um, it went up to about 46 kilodaltons with the oldest animals. And so, here I just want to point out too, was, this is what I was talking about, was that when we looked at fold changes, you did not, our involuntary group, which was maintained at 10 meters a minute, had a 6.5 fold increase, whereas our voluntary runners, they only had a two fold increase, and they ran at a much higher intensity than our involuntary runners. And then our swimming group, we didn't measure intensity of exercise, but they were in between the two groups of um, runners where I read other studies that have found that swimming is in between the two, between um, high intensity and low intensity exercise as well. Okay, so then we looked at immunohistochemistry, and so these are from the spinal cord, and I have my control here on the left, and then my exercise here on the right. And um, so for both of these, the red are stained for choline acetotransferase, which is the main enzyme that synthesizes acetylcholine, or um, choline acetotransferase, or yeah, acetylcholine, sorry. <laughs> okay, and then in green here, we have uh, GDNF. And so what you can immediately see is that with exercise, you get hypertrophy of these motor neurons. Well, when we quantified this, in fact, that's what we found, where all types of exercise had increased motor neuron cell body size compared to their controls. However, there was no difference between the two, um, be between the uh, groups of exercise. Now, one cool thing that we found was that um, with our exercise group, we found these vesicle-like structures of GDNF that were very evident compared to our control group, and others have found that GDNF um, follows this trend where it's found in vesicle-like structures, and it could be that there's an increase in retrograde transport of GDNF. Again, we didn't study this, but it could be one possibility. Okay, so then we wanted to see if two weeks of exercise affected the old animals. And so what we had done was started out these old animals with voluntary exercise, but we quickly found out that their maximum speed that they got to was two meters a minute. So to prevent any injury or um, any additional damage to the animals, we did not exercise them at 10 meters a minute or have them undergo swimming because with the swimming, they like to kick each other in the water. So <laughs> that would be too much stress for the old guys. And so though, with even at two meters a minute, which is a very low intensity walk um, exercise protocol, we found an increase in GDNF protein content um, as compared to their sedentary controls. And so right here with our Western blood, like I mentioned earlier, we found that molecular weight of GNF had increased in size with advancing age. And then there was a similar trend though with our ELISA and our Western blood. So then when we looked at immunosis chemistry, so again we have the red for um, choline acetotransferase, and then the green for GDNF, where we can see immediately again that the motor neurons are larger um, with the exercise compared to controls. And so when we had quantified this, 
again, it was almost a doubling effect that we saw. And interestingly, we saw with exercise more of these vesicle-like structures of gene up compared to controls again. So then the next step was, since we saw an effect with different durations of exercise, what if we, do we see an effect with increase in exercise? And so um, we looked at four weeks and we had, sorry, we had um, exercise 12-month-old animals. Interestingly, there was no change in GNF content following four weeks of exercise in the spinal cord compared to their age match controls. But when we looked at the motor neurons in the spinal cord, we saw still there was almost a doubling effect where we had a significant increase, excuse me, uh, with exercise compared to controls. Yet, there was a difference in staining pattern that we observed where, um, extra, where for this group, we found that GDNF seemed to be more, more localized to the motor neurons themselves, whereas with the control, um, it seemed to be more um, spread and um, dispersed within the spinal, entire spinal cord itself. So then the next step was, okay, four weeks in an alternate, what about a long duration of six months? And so these animals had started at 12 months, and then so they had finished at 18 months. And these animals had undergone voluntary exercise, and what we found, interestingly, was that there was no effect of exercise. And there was a trend toward a decrease with six months of exercise in the spinal cord. However, when we looked at the motor neuron cell body size. Again, we found that there was an increase in um, motor neuron size following <coughs> exercise than to comparative controls. Yet again, what we found was that, um, unlike the two week old exercise groups, that GDNF seemed to be more localized to the motor neurons themselves compared to being dispersed throughout the spinal cord. Okay, so let me go back to my little picture here. And I want to point out, so what we have found thus far was that two weeks and four weeks of exercise can increase GDNF protein content in the skeletal muscle. So when we looked at um, two weeks of exercise, we saw a similar effect where there was an increase in GDNF content in the spinal cord. However, long-term or chronic exercise of four weeks to six months had no effect. So, um, so then the next step was we wanted to look at disease animals. And so, let's see, now this goes on to my last two hypotheses, where we looked at ALS models. And now ALS models are specific um, diseases of motor neurons where they degenerate and then affect the motor units themselves. So we thought this would be a great model to see if um, exercise can indeed alter GNF protein content in um, a rapid disease of motor neuron degeneration. And so what we had done was, um, looked at a wild type set of mice, which were the C57BL6, as our controls. And then we also had a transgenic ALS model. And um, so what we had done was exercise the ALS animals prior to the disease onset. And um, this was to ensure that we could um, make sure that the animals had been affected by the disease and then look at exercise um, after or during their um, treatment. And then we also had um, anticipated to do low intensity exercise. However, we quickly found that these animals could not get up to 10 meters a minute. So we had decreased their um, intensity to 18 meters a minute. But again, just a slow walk training based on results from a previous study or our previous findings. And then, so at the conclusion of all experiments, we did similar just like in the rat um, where we had removed the lumbar spinal cord. And then we had quantified GDNF with an enzyme linked immunoabsorbent assay, and then with Westerblatt to measure protein size. And then we looked at immunohistochemistry of formalin and fixed tissues again. So in addition with the ALS animals, what we had done was monitor their weights daily because that was to help ensure um, disease progression and onset for all animals. And then we also had looked at neurological score where these animals um, progressively continue to get worse with their hind limbs. And um, so this was another uh, factor that we used to make sure that we had hit disease onset of these animals. And so once the animals had hit um, disease or stage one, which is trembling of the hind limbs during tail suspension, that had been characterized as disease onset. And once we had one animal that had reached that stage, we had exercised a lot. 
because the variability of disease onset for every animal is a little bit different and we wanted to make sure at least we had some that were in this group. Okay, so to start out, we had to exercise the wild type mice because we needed to make sure that um, the same effects would be, or if we had a similar effect with exercise in the mouse as we did in the rat. And so what we did was we looked at two weeks of exercise and then looked at um, eight meters a minute for that low intensity protocol. And we found that with um, our treatment that animals had an increase in GDNF protein content following two weeks of exercise as compared to their sedentary controls. And interestingly, this was a 25-fold increase as compared to their controls. So then when we looked at the molecular weight of GDNF, we found that there was this um, double band of GDNF that was about 25 and 28 kilodaltons, so a little different than the um, rats. However, this set, these animals were a lot younger too because we had age matched them for the ALS um, mice. And so that could be one factor why it's a little different than in the graph that we saw. So then when we looked at immunohistochemistry, again, we did the red for choline acetyltransferase and then green for GDNF. And we found that um, exercise had increased motor neuron cell body size, again, following two weeks of exercise. However, it was interesting that we did not see the vesicle-like structures of GDNF that were prominent with the um, rats following two weeks of exercise as we did with the mice here. So then the next step was we looked at the ALS animals. And so we had started these animals at 10 weeks of age and then they had exercised until um, about four weeks total of exercise. And we had, we had chosen to go that long to ensure that all the animals had undergone degeneration and, um, of those motor neurons and had those characteristics of the decrease in hind limb movement. Um, so, sadly though, too, um, we had started out exercising these animals at eight meters a minute, but we had to decrease it down to five meters a minute because they were very weak. And when you put them on a table, unfortunately, some of their hind limbs, they were so bad that they would just walk around in circles. So it was very rapid regeneration. And um, what we found, though, was that with four weeks of exercise, there was a decrease, or not a decrease, but a trend toward a decrease in GDNF. And then um, we also had looked at the treatment of animal, or of antibody treatment against GDNF for the animals, where these mice had received injections of anti-GDNF, where it blocked their endogenous levels, and, the, and then they had also been exercised. And these animals also had no change in GDNF content. Um, but I do want to point out is that with these animals, we found that the overall levels, though, of GDNF were much higher than in the controlled mice themselves. And that has been um, found, and others have found that as well. So then when we looked at Western blot, we had to stand for a couple different things on this. Um, interestingly, with um, our GDNF, we found three molecular weights, where we had a high molecular weight at 46, so similar to the very old animals, um, are very old rats, and then we had one at 25, and then another at 17. However, when we looked at densitometry analysis, there was no significant difference between any of the groups. Then we looked at the primary receptor for GDNF, which is GFR alpha 1, and we found that exercise and treatment of antibodies following and exercise had an increased expression of the primary GNF receptor, and that had translated to a 25 to 48 full change from controls. And then we had looked at caspase 3, which is a, a marker for uh, mitochondrial death. And so um, we found, though, that with the lower molecular weight of caspase, that there was a, a trend toward a significant change, so an increase with exercise and with the treatment. And then our negative control was our tubulin, where we didn't see any difference between the groups. So then, when we had looked at the choline, or cholinergic motor neurons and their size, we had found that actually exercise had decreased the size of the motor neurons. Where, um, oh, that's kind of cool. but uh, so both the exercise and the exercise plus the anti-GNF treatment had a decrease. And 
overall, though, it was a lot harder to find the motor neurons because um, they have more of a fragmented um, disposition as compared to with the healthy animals that are not diseased. And again, that is very um, characteristic of this um, of the ALS. And then, so when we had looked at um, GDNF and Cascase 3, we found that really there's no difference in GDNF between any of the groups. And then with Cascase 3, which is again the um, mitochondrial marker for a death, we saw a, maybe a slight increase, but overall no real big change there. Okay, so then, um, so we saw a decrease was that we saw a decrease with motor neuron size with exercise. So then we wanted to see overall um, number of motor neurons. So what we had done was we had um, proposed these box plots and at random sections within um, the lumbar spinal cord was we counted how many motor neurons were there. And interestingly, okay, we found that exercise actually had increased number of motor neurons. So suggesting some survival effect with exercise um, and with the anti-DNF treatment and exercise, they're, um, they were significantly less than the exercise group. So suggesting that um, there might be some link between blocking GDNF and exercising for motor neuron protection. Okay, so now going back to our model. So from these two sets of studies, what we had found was that in the healthy mice, two weeks of exercise had significantly increased GNF protein content in the spinal cord, but with the diseased animals, with the ALS, um, four weeks of exercise had no change um, in the in GNF content um, for the cell or the spinal cord. And so it was interesting though that we had similar effects, that with the rat and the mouse, two weeks of exercise had an increase in GNF content, but then the long durations of four weeks of exercise and, and more did not have an effect there. So what does this all mean together? So here we have my dad, that's me, and that's my kid, right? Um, no, not really, but okay. So, um, so basically, the implications of this and for our nervous system and well-being of our nervous system is, if, we, if she exercises, will that improve her quality of life? And then what about when she gets to his age? Or what happens when um, this little one exercises, will that improve her quality of life? If they have some kind of disease like diabetes or ALS or something like that um, at that age. Um, will 20 minutes of walking be the same as two hours of running? Is it a matter of pure exercise? Is it quantity versus quality or is it just exercising in general? And then finally, um, will their quality of life plateau just before they exercise? So I know a lot more studies are finding that the long term, like marathon running, is not as beneficial for the nervous system as the short bouts of exercise and just walk, walking 30 minutes a day seems to be more beneficial than, again, marathon running. So, okay, so as most of you know, um, I'm actually going to become a faculty member at Adrian College in the fall, and I'm going to continue to do my research there, where I'm going to take my project and um, work there in the exercise science department. And I would like to continue to study how exercise prescriptions can alter neurotrophic factors. And so we're going to start looking at human studies and measuring um, blood serum levels for neurotrophic factors, where um, interestingly, just some recent studies have found that in like Alzheimer's disease patients, there's a decrease in GDNF content with, um, with Alzheimer's, but then in the cerebral spinal fluid, there's an increase. So, um, I think there will be lots of potential there where we can look at different types of exercise prescriptions as well to study um, levels of neurotrophic factor. And then the cool thing is, um, at Adrian, they're building a new um, science building, and they had told me that they are going to make me a little lab. And so what I would like to do is look at zebrafish, where I can collaborate with biology there and um, measure neurotrophic factors in an animal model so that we can actually look at motor neurons and section them there or in skeletal muscle. It's kind of hard to do that in a human. <laughs> I don't think people like that. So there I like to continue looking at aging and different types of exercise to see how um, those are changing. And so um, my research questions and hypotheses going into Adrian is that um, my first one is neurotrophic factor production plateaus with exercise. 
Now, I think that based on what I've seen, with the two weeks of exercise, we saw an increase in response of neurotrophic factor production, but then it decreases with um, advancing our duration. And so it might be that there's an, a set threshold that the body can make or certain um, tissues can make, and then it sets it there, and it's distributed throughout the body. So I think it'd be interesting to see if, in fact, that there is some plateau phase that we hit this maximum threshold or not. Um, and then the other hypothesis that I would like to look at is um, intermittent exercise to see if that will increase neurotrophic factor production. Where, um, say, we run one day on, one day off, one day on, is that better than running five days on and two days off? So I think it'd be really interesting to see um, how um, intermittent exercise also affects neurotrophic